Okay, so refuge in Bodhicitta. We'll just do a little bit of an exploration now of basically being very clear about what is not a satisfactory refuge because we wanna break the spell, yeah? And if you break the spell of what you normally turn to for temporary refuge, then you're much more inspired to go more deeply and more regularly to things that are actually sustainable and will help you build that inner momentum with your practice. So this is gonna become the classic conversation of the eight worldly concerns, but um, we'll just kind of work our way into it. So if we take the prayer, right? This prayer, now this is the version that we use kind of in our daily prayers, as opposed to the version we use right before teachings. And the main difference is that we're talking about by my merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. In the previous version, it was by the merit of going to the teachings, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So you just kind of sit with, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. Yeah, that's how long I need to be going for refuge. Two, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, which we think of in terms of the doctor, the medicine, and the nurses, which means we under, understand ourselves to be in a way unwell. We understand ourselves to be a little bit sick with samsara, but implied in that or kind of behind that concept of seeing yourself as unwell means you have the potential for health, yeah? If you were just kind of an inherently sick person, in a way, there would be no need to describe yourself as sick because there's no opportunity for wellness. But e even by identifying as I am a little unwell with samsara, I'm unwell with anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, ignorance, these things make me sick mentally and physically, they make me unwell. You're also trying to tap into the fact that your deepest nature is incredible health a health that is so fully embodied that you're able to actually radiate that health and bring it out in others. And this is what we're talking about when we go to enlightenment. Yeah, it's about getting rid of all of the sickness, mental illness, physical illness, societal illnesses, environmental illnesses. These are the things that we're healing from. And we all have the potential to do that in a collaborative way but also in an internal individual way. So the Buddha is the doctor who's basically just explaining the diagnosis. He's just saying, look, I see your symptoms and they mean this, but he can't fix you, right? He can only prescribe medicine. It's your choice whether or not to take it. And the medicine is the Dharma and the Dharma is really any tool that's going to lead to sustainable health sustainable health, any kind of tool leading to sustainable health that is not harming anyone else along the way. This is Dharma. And Buddhist Dharma is, you know, Buddhist medicines, but it's not like we have the only kind of medicine. And so the real Dharma is similar to what we were talking about a minute ago, which is the real refuge is what you have integrated. The inner conversation you have with your own wisdom that's been imbued with lots of study and reflection and meditation on the things that will protect your mind. And then this Supreme Assembly in the relative sense, this is your community or this is monks and nuns, nurses of the type that can say, let's look at pacing of your medicine. Let's look at dosage. You know, let's look at making sure that just because it's medicine doesn't mean you should take it all at once because the very thing that's going to cure you could also make you unwell if you don't take it at the appropriate speed or in the right way at the right time. And the reason why the nurses might have a good thing to offer you is that they're closer to you in their path. Right, So they've already gone through a lot of the pitfalls and they can help you navigate around them and not do the same mistakes they, mis they made, or they can help you go a speed that they went. It's a companion on the path. And you know, if you've ever been to a traditional Western hospital, you know that the nurses are the ones that do a lot of the everyday getting the job done stuff. So your community holds you, even if you don't like them. <laughs> 
your community holds you, even if you don't relate to them on a friendship level. The way in which the community holds you is that they're all trying. And to be with other people who are actually trying to be introspective, to move along a spiritual path is so much more support than being with people who haven't considered working for the greater good or working within. When you're with people who haven't even considered a spiritual path or considered some sort of inner development, there's still good kind people out there, you know, kind of incidentally, and they're benign often, sometimes not, but you don't feel the same support for your own growth because they don't really get what you're on about. So it's not to like diminish them or to think of them as less than, it's just noticing that there's a different type of support that happens when you're with other people who are on a spiritual path. And so this is what we go to refuge to. And then by the merit or the mental momentum or the good karma created by practicing the path, for example, the perfections, generosity and patience, right? Ethics, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom. By the momentum we create by practicing these things, we will become Buddhas ourselves to benefit sentient beings. So this prayer is one of our most common, deepest, most succinct prayers. Um, it's a good one to kind of take to heart in some way, even if you reframe it in words that resonate with you. But um, this is the essence of what we're talking about. So this is what we talked about yesterday, just kind of looking at what do we take refuge in and why? And then here's what Buddhists take refuge in and why. So the three jewels refer to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Yeah, meaning Buddha as the doctor, Dharma as the medicine, Sangha as the nurses. And we go to them because they're reliable. So a valid source of refuge has to be reliable, which is why regular ordinary people are not a good source of refuge. They can be a good source of friendship, entertainment, connection, you know, basic needs, you know, definitely a source of gratitude and recognizing interconnection. But regular folks have afflictions, which means they're inconsistent. You know, we're inconsistent, they're inconsistent don't rely on them to save you from anything, right? Rely on them in a worldly sense in order to, you know, collaborate to get the job done. But for your spiritual path, you want to look at something that actually holds water. And that would be something that itself is free from fear. Yeah, so the Buddha is free from fear free from anxiety, all of this kind of like neurotic tendencies that regular folks have, which are completely understandable and we offer compassion towards, but the Buddha does not have that because he trained himself out of it. Yeah, and we can all do the same. And a Buddha is also skilled in freeing others from fear, not by grabbing them and yoinking them to enlightenment, you know, it's not like he's going to save us but he's freeing others from fear by teaching the same methods he used to get himself out of this mess. So skilled in freeing others from fear really means teaching effective Dharma. Now a valid source of refuge has to have unbiased compassion, right? They need to be impartial, benefiting all equally, whether they help or harm, right? Whether they're a good person or a bad person or dodgy or whatever, it's like a real refuge is not going to be distracted by those surface behaviors. An enlightened being is going to understand all problematic behaviors as symptoms of afflictions and suffering and not say that they're okay, but have compassion for them. They're not going to see someone who is amazing and altruistic and generous and a good person and doing all the right thing as somehow superior. They're going to see them as someone who is very fortunate to have met conditions to be able to have growth. So they're loving them the same, they're supporting them the same. And when we're looking towards a valid source of refuge, this is what we're looking for. Reliable because of these reasons. So when you look at these reasons, do you have any kind of qualms or issues come up or things that you find resistance to?
or kind of ideas that come to mind? Yeah, Christina. Uh, yeah, it seems quite different from the Judeo-Christic concept where uh, you're going to be saved by Jesus or and here that we're getting the teachings from the Buddha and the Sangha, but we have to apply ourselves. Yeah, and I mean, of course, it depends on the commentary, right? So, you know, of course, in a lot of Judeo-Christian traditions, there's a similar idea of you need to do the work yourself. And, you know, the saints and the apostles and the disciples are modeling ways of life and, you know, God is love. And so it really, you know, it's, it's hard to paint it with a broad brush. But certainly when we're talking about, like, fundamentalism of any kind of religion, Buddhism included, Fundamentalist thinking kind of wants you to give up self-determination. You know, fundamentalist thinking wants you to have an authoritarian personality that gives all of your power to an authority. And when you yourself have power to dominate, right? Like that's what fundamentalism can do to us. And that we all can see is really unhealthy in whatever form it takes, whether it's religious or spiritual or even academic or psychological, you know, it can happen anywhere where people find a beautiful doctrine, become somewhat proficient in embodying certain aspects and explaining certain aspects. And then that somehow gives them permission to say, I will save you, but only me and only these methods. And if you don't follow me, you're doomed, you know, and that should always give us red flags, right? When people start talking that way, <laughs> red flag, right? Run away. <laughs> uh, also too is that sometimes I think that uh, maybe that is all the person is capable of receiving at this time in their incarnation. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And, and certainly there's, there's a lot of folks that live a very ethical, kind life as the result of blind faith. There are, and you know, it's just, you know, we wanna ask ourselves, is blind faith the deepest we as an individual can go where our mind is at right now? And if it is, you know, it is. But if we have the mental space and we have the conditions to kind of be more empowered, you know, and to really examine deeply what is my potential and how do I grow into it, you know, and not kind of like wait for salvation, it can be a lot more enriching, you know, and it can also be a lot more grounded in times of crisis because sometimes you'll find that people with only blind faith that haven't used logic and experience that when things are tough they lose their faith because it feels as if god has abandoned them yeah so so i think there there's a there's an argument for it being useful in certain contexts as you say or maybe some people aren't ready to go further with it yet um, and we don't want to ruin it for them <laughs> right but um but if people have an openness to go a little bit deeper, that's an inner conversation for ourselves that's worth having, I think, yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts that come up about these like criteria for reliability? I'm guessing we all come from many different faith traditions before we met Buddhism and uh, left for various reasons, which may not have wound up being about the religion itself, but perhaps about the expression of it or the practitioners of it who are maybe having inconsistencies or something like that. I, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that by speaking these highest ideals, we start to aspire to them and we're inspired by them. And then we expect to see it <laughs> in all of the other practitioners around us. And we're still learning, you know, and we need to have a kind of a humility and a patience and a sense of humor with this is going to take a while even if we love it even if we're all in and we think yep this is how i want to live and these are the things i want to rely on that loving it itself is not enough for us to actually have the reliance you know we have to really mull it over ourselves again and again because when push comes to shove are we gonna revert to our old habits or are we gonna take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, particularly the Dharma that we've integrated? Or are we gonna take refuge in chocolate? You know, 
<laughs> right? Or gossiping with our friends about nonsense, you know? And, and to have enough kindness and patience that knows that you're gonna forget and slip and that that's not a failure, it's just part of the process and you just pick yourself up and regroup and pick yourself up and regroup. And that is spiritual maturity not saying I'm a failure, I can't do this, never mind. That's that spiritual immaturity, right? That, which isn't really recognizing how much potential you truly have. Our, our mistakes have a lot of momentum, so it's gonna take a while. Yeah, Christina. That's, what, that's one of the things that I found uh, very valuable about uh, Buddhist teachings is that uh, it's practice that, you know, sometimes you might fail, but you do, uh, continue and you know maybe if you have to take a few backward steps get up and come forward again you're not sort of excommunicated yeah exactly exactly you're not going to get kicked out right nobody's going to kick you out you could be totally dodgy and they're not going to kick you out now the communities might say you're too dodgy to live with us but the buddhas are never going to kick you out right yeah yeah and you know you're you're never gonna lose your Buddha potential no matter how messy you get. Yeah, you cannot ruin it. And that should be somewhat reassuring. Yeah, yeah any, any more thoughts about the reliability conversation? Uh, could you um, expand a little bit on the um, value of taking refuge with a refuge master? Yeah. I don't yeah. know whether that's gonna fit in with this morning or another part of the sessions. Yeah, no, we could talk about it now. What's what's the benefit of taking refuge with a particular person and the lineage? It's, it's an important conversation because, of course, you can take refuge and like become a Buddhist all by yourself, alone in your room with your little Buddha statue and from your heart do a procedure. And that is refuge. And some traditions like um, the Zen tradition, for example, they often encourage that mode or to do it with your peers. And there's not particularly a teacher present, but you're all kind of acknowledging one another's commitment to a path. But the benefit of the connection with the lineage is that you're connecting to the oral transmission, the unbroken oral transmission from your teacher all the way to the Buddha. And it's almost like an energetic slipstream where things go a little bit more fast and a little bit deeper because you're connecting to people who are already on a roll, right? It's a little bit like if you're exercising with someone who is healthier than you, they might push you to try things that you wouldn't try on your own. If you're studying with someone who's a few steps ahead of you, they might kind of pull you up to their speed quicker than if you were just alone with your book. You know, so it's, it's really kind of using the momentum of others that are already in flow or perhaps even finished with their path and using that. You know, it's, it's an added support. And so connection with the lineage is something that can be hard to articulate, but when you feel it, it it's very much like an extra layer of clarity or an extra layer of connection. It's a, and in a way, it's a con commitment as well. Like for some people, you know, being in a committed relationship is enough. And for other people, making it a marriage adds something intangible but important. Do you know what I mean? And whether you're, you know, of that mindset or not, you know, kind of just use it as an example. What does it mean to commit to and join with? And what exactly is that? So if you think the Buddha was not the first Buddha or the last Buddha, but he was the most recent one to show the full aspect of complete enlightenment. And he explained the whole path, including Tantra. We want a karmic connection with the Buddha because not every Buddha teaches the whole path because sometimes the merit of sentient beings isn't there for the whole path to be taught. So, you know, Buddha Shakyamuni is someone we want a deep karmic relationship with, and we already do have some, otherwise we wouldn't have met Buddhism to begin with. So then who is our teacher? You know, our teacher is the most recent link in the chain, but you wanna just take a little bit of an objective step back and say, okay, if they're a lineage holder, you know, someone who is connected to that unbroken oral tradition, that's very important for taking refuge with, but I need to also recognize that I'm making a relationship with this person who is the teacher giving the refuge. 
So it's not just with the Buddha and the tradition, it's also with this person in front of me. And do I feel like they can be a spokesperson for the Buddha? Yeah, in a, in a tantric relationship, it becomes even more strong and it becomes seeing them as the Buddha. But in a sutra relationship, you really need to train in hearing the Buddha through their voice. You know, and can you hear the Buddha through their voice in such a way that you don't feel kind of resistance and obstacles to such a degree that it's gonna interfere with your progress? You know, and can you train in seeing their behaviors as teachings for you? It's, it's an important thing to look at because definitely the teacher needs to have ethics. Yeah, you know, ethics of non-harmfulness and a real groundedness in their practice. In terms of their realizations and qualities, you can only make an educated guess because we can't take another person's measure, but you can watch for their ethical discipline, watch how they interact with students of different types. They might be different with all students because everyone has different personalities. But are they, um, you know, dismissive or rude to some in such a way that seems really not equanimity, you know, not like a, a skillful means because this person is being kind of needy or something, but like they seem really dismissive or harsh, or do they seem to have some sort of like romantic energy with some students in a way that feels like creepy boundaries, you know, you, you just want to have your like, you know, have your common sense activated. And if it feels kind of, uh, you know, give it a minute, right? It could be your own stuff. It could be all your own projection, or it could be that you're noticing something problematic. So take a few beats, you know, don't rush it, you know, and just kind of check. So you want to have an open mind and not judge people too harshly, but also don't go in kind of blinded, you know, and with rose colored glasses and assume that because someone is, I don't know, Tibetan, or if they're monastic, or if they have a big name, don't assume that means qualities, right? Don't assume that Geshe means enlightened, Geshe means educated, you know? So, so just kind of like gently, gently, eyes wide open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, you wanted to add something? In the teachings that I've um, gotten in, in, um, in Zen, um, a lot have said lineage is akin to family. Family like, um, well, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has talked about um, lineage. Um, he, he attributes uh, one of the sayings that he had was like your mother, your only mother, or mm -hmm. your, your mother to her only child. Um, yeah. Meaning, you know, a, a, a mother who is a guardian who loves her child so much and will guide them to, um, to the best means. When I heard about lineage and in accordance with family, my, um, my perception was finally, um, I'm not alone in this. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, and, and there's, there's something very beautiful to that approach. And there's something a little bit dangerous in that approach to just kind of know, you know, and then manage for yourself. Because what happens when you're developing a strong relationship with someone is that you've never necessarily had a guru disciple relationship before, but you've had mm -hmm. different kind of closeness before. So it's very common to project uh, parental baggage on the teacher or yeah. partner baggage on the teacher, you know? And like, why aren't they paying attention to me? Why aren't they texting me back? Why aren't they looking at me? You know, like you can get a little neurotic if you have baggage with those associations. But if you're thinking I'm starting freshly an adult relationship that is parental, but starting it as an adult, you know, not starting as a child or a teenager with all that history you have with your actual parents, but you're sort of starting freshly as an adult and thinking, yeah the way that in which they care for me is to teach me how to heal myself. The way in which they care for me is to explain the ways to wisdom. And they're explaining the ways to wisdom again and again in a million different ways, sometimes with teaching, sometimes with behaviors, but they're not gonna like come and check on me and make sure I have warm socks. 
(laughs) (laughs) right? And, you know, they're not going to be telling me that my haircut looks cute, you know? (laughs) And so as long as we're like managing our expectations and realizing that care in this context is a very mature form of care, then I think that's a really beautiful approach to think of it in terms of family. And certainly your Sangha community feels very much like family, like for better or for worse, like these are your siblings, right? And like, sometimes you do not get along, like the love is there, but sometimes the liking, not so much, right? (laughs) And you know, you do your best, but there's a strong karmic connection, isn't there, with your community, right? For better or worse. Yes. And, you know, and it's worthwhile kind of like sitting with that. If you've got strong karma with people, you're going to just keep bumping into them life after life. You're probably going to keep having the same teacher again and again if you're lucky, right? So it's like work out your dramas because it's not like you can avoid it forever. You're just going to meet them again and again. Yeah. <laughs> All the way to enlightenment. When, um, the dharmas, I look at also the, um, I might be going into a dark area, but um, when I need to get into the deep, really look into the dark and deep, um, you were talking about the um, other religions that you might want to go into. The reason why I went into um, Buddhism is because with the other religions, although they ask for forgiveness, they ask for um, don't hold something against another person. Mm. That is no resentment. They really don't give you tools to work with. How do you do that? It's mostly you have to do that or else. Yeah, yeah. And that that approach, you know, again, I think that's symptoms of fundamentalism. I think probably all great world religions have beautiful strategies for forgiveness that are very step by step and practical and heart centered and logical and everybody's got great tools. But the problem is human beings get a hold of these things, and then get their egos involved mess, you know. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's fair enough to assess a community and say, maybe the religion is great, but the people aren't practicing it with enough consistency and integrity for me to join them right now. All the best, trying something else, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's so important for us to keep really a, a universal respect for many traditions and for people with no tradition, believers, non-believers, you know, atheists, because they are kind, ethical people with a deep practice in a million different forms. And there is huge harm done by fundamentalist thinking, you know, so if we can make that distinction really clear in our mind that it's not the religion's fault that people are messed up, you know, but people will mess up the most beautiful of things, you know, like the Spanish Inquisition, not cool, right? Not at all cool. Holocaust, not cool. None of that was okay. But that wasn't the heart of the teachings either. That was people ruining it. And so if we know that, then us as Buddhists or as Buddhist aspirants, hopefully we will not distort the Dharma with our own egos and our own afflictions. You know, that's that's really the lesson in all of this is how do I, as an individual, not become a fundamentalist? How do I not ruin this beautiful thing? You know, it's so important. With ceaseless practice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Again and again. So so we're going to look a little bit more now at um, (laughs) what we do instead of refuge. Um, We talk a little bit about this, like, limited forms. So these are limited forms of refuge that we take, and we're going to do a meditation on this. But basically, you guys, a lot of you know about the eight worldly concerns, and this is what we do when we forget about deep refuge. So it's basically pairs of hope and fear. Yeah, pairs of hope and fear. So you're hoping for happiness and you're fearing suffering. You're hoping for fame and you're fearing insignificance. You're hoping for praise, you're fearing blame. You're hoping for gain, you're fearing loss. So it's hope and fear in a neurotic way or in an unhealthy way, basically attachment and aversion. So, you know, to kind of put them in a list here. So we just think about attachment to getting and keeping material things or situations or people, you know, or scenarios. 
it's not that you can't have goals or look for some sort of stability and consistency. It's that you're banking on your happiness being a result of that. Yeah, you're thinking, if I get this, then I will be happy. If I keep this, then I will be happy. And it's that attachment that exaggerates the importance of the thing that has value, but not as much value as attachment says it does. And it's that exaggeration that disempowers us. And then we have this aversion to not then being separated from it because we think, because then suffering, right? If I don't get what I want, I'm going to suffer. And that again, disempowers us. So we're trying to hold the common sense of, yes, I need housing. Yes, I need food. Yes, I need friendship, meaningful work. These are all useful things. These are loosely true but bringing some sort of flexibility of wisdom that says it doesn't have to be tightly the form I expect it to be. It doesn't have to look exactly like I planned it to be. And what's more, the main thing giving me the contentment and the safety and the stability is my mental attitude toward it. So, you know, we're going to take this kind of gain and loss one just, you know, as the example. And You know, I was thinking about, I was just on a road trip from Montana to California and I had to stop in a hotel and part of me was like, Ooh, I'm in a hotel. I haven't been in a hotel for ages, you know, since the pandemic. Oh my goodness. And then I was laughing because it's like, but it's smaller than where I just was. Right. Like it's just a room and a bathroom and a shower. Right. Before I had a room, a bathroom, a shower and a hallway, (laughs) you know, like, Ooh, right. But you know, it was like, in my mind, I had given it permission to be better and exotic and important. And so then I was delighted. But if I had to live my whole life in a hotel room, I feel that the novelty would wear off, right? I feel that at some point I would say, this is not the happiness that it started out to be, right? And these tiny soaps, I don't know, these tiny soaps, they're not right. But, you know, this is what our mind does, right, is that it creates a picture in our mind and then it believes in it. And then it's like that bounces back and reinforces itself. And attachment wouldn't be a problem if the spell was never broken, but it's always going to be broken because it was never true. Yeah, it was nominally true. And then we built the whole story around it. And then when disillusionment comes you know when reality dawns then we're like mad at ourselves or mad at someone else or mad at the situation like it lied to us but we lied to us right this is the thing about the eight worldly concerns we were the ones that lied to ourselves and now we're mad about it and needing to blame but if we were kind of seeing things more accurately in the relative level even it would be a lot easier for us So then when we're struggling, we turn to these refuges, these false refuges, these limited refuges, and we say, I need this in order to be happy. And so like, for example, we get attachment to praise or hearing nice words or feeling encouraged, feeling validated, feeling seen. Is it wrong to want to be validated and seen? Of course not. But thinking that you need it in order for happiness, again, disempowers you. And it also is not true, because if you're in a very needy state, an attachment state, and someone says you are wonderful and you're doing everything so well, you'll say, what else? (laughs) Yeah, or no, I'm not, right? You'll go into, I need more of that, or I don't believe that, right? So before you heard what you wanted to hear, you were sure it was going to seal the deal and make you content. But then you hear it, and it doesn't work. Yeah. You say, I don't believe you. I'm not so good. Or I do believe you, but I'm going to need to hear more. Right. (laughs) One of the two. And then we think if we're blamed or ridiculed or criticized, that that will definitely destroy our peace, you know, and no one deserves to be blamed or ridiculed or criticized. It's not a useful communication strategy. That is a true thing in the relative sense. However, it is not the source of your suffering in and of itself. Right. And, you know, you just have to unpack the way that has been something you already knew. Right. Like if a small child that you're looking after says, I hate you, you're terrible. You think somebody needs a nap. 
right? You don't think I am bad, right? You're like, somebody needs a snack or a nap or a cuddle or a story or someone's having a rough time, right? If you're looking after a little kid and they say something horrible to you. You know, if you're really tired and stressed, it might still hit you a little and you're like, oof, ouch, that was, that was a rough thing to hear. But anyway, they're a little kid, they're tired, right? But then when an adult says it, you don't think, oh, someone needs a snack, right? <laughs> but it's, it's pretty much just as true, right? Like someone really has low blood sugar and let's find them a cookie, right? Yeah, hangry, right? They've gotten hangry, hungry, angry. Um, or you don't think something about me is triggering them and I've become a condition for their suffering, which is the last thing I wanna be. I don't wanna be a condition for anyone's suffering. And maybe you did nothing in this life to be a condition for their suffering, but they've got a whole projection story about you. And now just the sight of you, they're aggravated. It doesn't mean it's your fault. It doesn't mean it's something you need to take on. But if they're expressing horrible words, you know they're not in a good place, right? We're, we're adults. We know this, right? But then in the moment when someone's being awful, we just take it to heart and we think, how dare you? Or, oh, yes, that's true depending on our tendencies, right? Yeah, you're totally wrong and totally bad, or I'm totally wrong and totally bad. <laughs> but we don't stop and think, suffering. Oh, they're suffering. Yep, I know what it is to suffer. And when I suffer, I'm also unskillful. You know, shared humanity, universal human experience. Yep, I'm not gonna retaliate. I'm just gonna hold the space. And I'm not going to let you walk all over me. And I'm not going to be passive. I'm still going to be assertive. But I'm not going to retaliate. And I'm not going to dominate. And I'm not going to try and put them in their place. Right? I'm just going to hear your suffering. Right? What would I like someone to respond to me? If I was being snarky, you know, and kind of like nice, how would I like someone to call me on it in a way that was respecting my humanity, but not allowing my bad behavior. You know, and that's kind of a confronting thought. Like, how would you like to be called out? Let's sit with that. Yeah, if you're in a bad way, like your bestest friend who knows you really well, what could they say to you that would kind of pop the bubble of your aggression? You know, could you have your aggression bubble popped or would even your best friend not be able to get through to you? So these kind of self-knowings Increase pathways of empathy with other people, which automatically means you're more patient. You can hold the space for them being out of control, really badly behaved. If you can keep patience and keep kind of mental space, then you can address the behavior with a skillful, peaceful mind. Yeah, yeah, there's a question from the Gompa. Yeah, go ahead, Teresa. So this I'm always thinking about and always coming up against. And sometimes it seems like I just have to be silent, basically, all the time. <laughs> right. I don't do anything wrong. Yeah. And also, nobody else should talk to me. Right. <laughs> right. It's <laughs> just better not, if there's no talking. That's not really possible. Right. So if I, we've just talked about what not to do. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what to do in relationship where there's going to be talking and listening. Right. Right. Did you guys hear that? Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, Teresa's question, I think, is a good universal question. Um, when you're trying to have right speech, um, sometimes it feels like right speech is no speech. Right. And um, having no triggers, eight worldly concern triggers is not hearing anybody just. Yeah. And then we've been in the, you know, various lockdown scenarios. And do you ever start missing just those like totally worldly conversations with cashiers at grocery stores? Like you become so like humans. I just want someone to say nice day out, you know, but before you were like, people are so frivolous. We don't need to talk about the weather. What is this? We should have meaningful conversations all the time. But then like several months of pandemic, you're like, will someone please talk about the weather with me? <laughs> humans. Okay. But, you know, I think that instead of over planning what you're going to say or how you're going to hear, it's about organizing your mental space, right? If you organize your mental space to be patient and non-reactive, you know, or to manage your reactivity if you can't be non-reactive, because that's sometimes we got days like that, 
then you don't have to over plan what you're going to say or do then what you say or do is going to be in the flow of your best abilities mm. yeah it's not to say that you can't rehearse certain difficult conversations like big difficult conversations yeah stand in front of the mirror and say mom you have a drinking problem okay no don't say it like that say okay so when i see you know you can rehearse big scary conversations with the mirror with your friends if you need to but in terms of daily life stuff, you don't want to stifle the present moment by over planning it. You want to come inward to your deepest refuge and your deepest motivations. And then you speak from there and it's going to be as good as it's going to get. So it's like you do your best and let go and do your best and let go. And it's, it's a little bit like in these quiet moments by yourself, you can have kind of inner conversations of what are some things I need to stop saying? or what are some things I need to try saying, but don't make it too specific to, you know, I guess, make yourself inauthentic or like not in the moment with folks. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, the moment is always a lot more spontaneous than what you've rehearsed, you know? So, so there's, you know, like, as we become more socially aware, there's certain words that we need to train ourselves out of saying, you know, there's certain phrases that we're trying to train ourselves to say, and that's really wonderful work to show compassion for others. But, you know, if you're in the moment, you can also make mistakes and correct them without it being like a defensive thing or like a too much energy with it thing. Do you know what I mean? Is that what you were asking though? Or are you feeling something else? No, I think that like going inside before I speak. Yeah. And maybe even as I'm listening to people going inside rather than getting caught up, then there's just less drama. Yeah. 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 I just want to say for me, <clears throat> one thing I've realized is my need to be wanted and liked yeah. and belong. And that's, I think when I think about it, I need to go inside and work with those parts of me. Because yeah. then in relation to other people talking and listening, that's where I get tripped up. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think that the, the thing in all of this, and we'll, we'll take a break in a second and have a little stretch and then come back and have a meditation. But the thing to remember in all of this is don't get too lost in the content right like in thinking I have to correct this content or that content it's much more about the mentality you're bringing to the content right and this is what the eight worldly concerns is you know conversation is asking us to look at is to say there's a reason to be wanted and needed that is functional and there's a reason to be wanted and needed that is dysfunctional so it's not the you know it's not the raw wanting to be wanted and needed right there's part of you that knows in order to be of service to others, it helps if others like me, right? It's hard to be of service if everyone finds me irritable, right? But then there's like a panicky, needy, I must be, you know, sort of seen and acknowledged and honored and respected and everyone should have the CV of my life and see how remarkable I've been and see all the chapters of my learning and sort of like, I don't know, lift me up and praise me and, you know, it can get weird right? It can get weird, right? Or it can just be like you're lonely and like desperate for contact. And so you're just kind of like, you know? And so what you're wanting to ask yourself is why? And to acknowledge the neurotic and to, and to acknowledge the wisdom. So this is the tricky thing with the way we get wired and our like personalities, which are not inherently existent and are not permanent, but we trend a certain way, right? And we trend a certain way, and that doesn't mean we have to totally change the trend. What we want is to sh transform it from neurotic to enlightened or from dysfunctional to functional. Yeah, so you ask yourself, all right, so what's just, it's just a trait. There's a positive and a negative to most traits. How can I make sure that I'm coming from the best place with it? Yeah, and when I'm not coming from the best place with it, how can I manage my own suffering because it's the suffering that's driving me to do it dysfunctionally. So I'm not like squashing and saying, don't be needy squash, you know, or don't be um, disassociated or, you know, isolating or like, fine, no one likes me, I'll go home, you know, <laughs> right? Like how to manage the fact that the reason you're getting dysfunctional is because you're hurting. So instead of let's get the things that my dysfunction wants, 
because if you get the things your dysfunction wants, it will never be enough, right? And that's how you know if it's coming from attachment or not, right? If it's not coming from attachment, then you're kind of in the flow and you're contented easily, right? But if you're feeling like, okay, I need this and I need that and I need that, let's take a step back. I am really suffering right now. What is the deepest suffering that I can name? You know, and you're just like your own best friend, you know, and to really sit with, I'm allowed to feel suffering. Suffering is the first noble truth after all. <laughs> I wouldn't even be on a spiritual path if I didn't understand that suffering is something that I want to understand and move through. So let's actually understand the first noble truth and go back to basics. What is suffering? And then why am I suffering? I'm not suffering because of lack of affection or lack of validation. I'm suffering because of karma and disturbing emotions and the condition is lack of affection and lack of connection, you know, but it could be any number of conditions mm -hmm. because right now I have a negative karma ripening. And so if we can understand a little bit that karma has lag time, you know, one seed ripens and it's got to wear itself out before the next seed is, you know, able to sprout. You want to start watering the good seeds while the bad seed is sprouted. And if you can do that, that negative seed will finish and die a natural death. And the next one to blossom into experience is going to be a happy one. But just by thinking in a dharmic way is not going to make you happy in that moment. There's going to be lag time. So that's why all these Lojong teachings and thought transformation teachings are so powerful, but also they don't work in the exact second unless you've really caught the negativity in its infancy. You know, so it's like you do your mental training and you're just trying to let that gently seep in, you know, circuit breaker and adjust. Yeah. So the easiest way to get rid of your eight worldly concerns acknowledge that you have them and to see the way in which they play out so we'll do that meditation um let's have like a five minute stretch pd break